Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for the brothers who bring, bring the pulpit up. Thank you for all the guys that, working at, that are working in the sound booth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the guys that give us the uh, announcements in the morning. You know, I would never be able to do this alone. We're, we're a team. We're a body. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. And, and that's precisely what I would like to talk to you about this morning, about the church. We're starting a series today entitled, Why Church? Why Church? Why? Why is church so important? We want to answer crucial questions in this series. What is the church? Who is part of the church? Why, why does the church exist? Why is the church important to us today? How do we fit into the church? And we're going to, by God's grace, we're going to answer those questions as we move on, uh, move forward in this series. The church obviously is not the three buildings that we have here, building A, B, and C. It's not the building. It's the believers that are here. We comprise the church. We, we are the church. We are the church. In the past, God spoke through godly men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through prophets, Moses, Samuel, Elijah, through kings, David and Solomon, godly kings, but in the last days, God has chosen to speak and to work through the church. God has established the church in this time. When Christ rose from the dead, he established the church. And Christ is the cornerstone of the church, the foundation of the church. He is the owner and builder of the church. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, after Jesus had asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they said, well, Peter actually was the one, he's, he's the outspoken of the group. And he said, uh, well, some say that you're Elijah the prophet. Others say that you are different things. But he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then he followed that with this verse. In verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, meaning himself, he is the rock. On this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build, I, who's building the church? Christ. Will build my church. Who owns the church? Christ. And he says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The thought there is not that the gates of hell are attacking the church. No, that the church is attacking the gates of hell. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the attack of the church. Christ is the cornerstone. In Ephesians, uh, Paul mentions that Christ is the cornerstone and the foundation. And there's a few verses there in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. It says, oh, I love this verse. I'm sure that you guys love it too. So then, you are, you are no longer strangers and aliens. We're no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. I don't know if any of you have felt rejection, maybe by even members of your family. We're fellow citizens with the saints and we are members of God's family. If we don't feel like we have a family, we're part of God's family. If you're a believer, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you're part of God's family. 
And God doesn't kick out his children. He doesn't disown his children. Never. If we don't do it to our children, how much less will God do it to us? Isn't that awesome? He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never cast you out. But then in verse 20, it says, household, uh, members of the household of God build, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And I'll explain what cornerstone is in a minute. In verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built up together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It says several things about the church here. First of all, that we, that the foundation and the cornerstone is Jesus Christ, and we are joined together, and we grow to be what? A holy temple. In the past, we had a temple built of rock, right? A building where people would go and worship. Before that, there was the tabernacle. It was like a, a tent where God's presence would dwell. Now, in these days, the presence of God dwells in us. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit not only comes to live in us, but the Holy Spirit comes to live in every other believer and links us all together to form the body of Christ, the, 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 the church, the bride of Christ. And it says that we are built together into a dwelling place for God. By the Spirit. The Spirit does the work of, of putting the church together and making it function, making it work. That is extremely special. And we're part of that. We are part of that. That is awesome. We're part of something much, much greater than ourselves. Much greater than ourselves. And I think every one of us have that longing, don't we? We have the longing to really make an impact, to make a, to make a difference in our lives, to, to be part of something that's greater than ourselves. Well, we are the church. We are the church. The church has a universal expression, of course. There's brothers and sisters of ours all over the world. And we also have a local expression, the Rock Miami, my church, our church. This is our local expression, and that's where we fit in. This is where we fit in. This is where we can serve and, and love each other and reach out to, to the community around us. This is where we fit in. Now, the word cornerstone is, is very, very important. In ancient times, of course, the builders did not have a blueprint, no architects, nothing like that. So they had what they called the cornerstone. The cornerstone was what the builders would put in the corner of the building. It's the most solid rock, the most well-defined rock, and that rock would be the guide for the builders to build the rest of the building. It would determine the, the, the uh, dimensions and, and where the, the building would be, and it would be a guide to, to build that building. It's usually the most solid rock in the construction. And the Bible says that Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. He's the foundation and he's the example. He's the guide. He's the one that tells us, hey, this is the direction I want the church to go in. This is what I want the church to be like. This is what he is the one building and directing the church. He is the foundation of the church. He determines every measure in the remaining structure. He's the cornerstone, and he determines everything. As the cornerstone of the building, Jesus is our standard and measure and alignment for the church. Now, what is the church? We mentioned that the church is the believers together, right? Now, in 1 Peter... Peter mentions, he gives us a little bit more light on the church. <coughs> it's 
excuse me, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You come to him, Christ, a living stone. He was rejected by men. He came to his own. His own rejected him. But he says to those who believe in his name, he gives them the right to become children of God. So he is chosen and precious to God. In verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are built, are being built up by Christ. Of course, we read that in, in Matthew. As a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices accepted or acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are like living stones. That's how Peter puts it. We are living stones and we are being built up to be a spiritual house where God dwells and a holy priesthood. What does a priest do? To, to put it in simple terms, talks to people about God and talks to God about people, right? Talks to God, intercedes for people, and then he also talks to people about God. And he offers spiritual sacrifices. And we, each one of us are priests. God has called us to be priests, to speak out for the Lord, to speak, to reach others for Christ, to be a holy priesthood for Christ. The body, the church, is a spiritual house it's also the body of Christ. Just like we have a body, I have feet, I have hands, I have eyes, I have a mouth. They are all different members, but put together, they are my body. We are the body of Christ, and we have different gifts and different talents that God uses. When we have a situation, there's, there's a meeting a brother might say, hey, I'll set up the tables. I'll set up the chairs. That brother has the gift of service. A brother might say, hey, I can, I can give an encouraging message. Maybe he has the gift of teaching or of, or of encouragement. Hey, I'll greet the people. I'll go out and greet the people as they come in. Maybe that person has the gift of, of, of encouragement, of, of reaching out to others, of, of, of maybe even evangelism. We all have different gifts, so when we think about a problem or a situation, we all think about them, think about that situation according to our gifts and talents. And we may see different angles. We are not, God never meant for us to work alone. He meant for us to work together as a church. That's what he wants. In John 15, he, uh, the Lord mentions that we are the branches and he is the vine. As the branches, we live and grow through him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he mentions that we are the body of Christ. As the body, we function through him and he functions through us. In Ephesians chapter 2, it mentions that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in and through us as a family. As the bride of Christ in chapter 5 of Ephesians, he mentions that we are the bride of Christ. Christ died for the bride and he cleanses her through the washing of the word. And he gives good gifts to the church. In John chapter 10, it says that we're the sheepfold. We're the sheepfold. He's the shepherd. He's the good shepherd that lays down his life for his sheep, and we're his sheep. And as his sheep, Jesus is our gate. He opens and closes, and he's the gate to heaven, to eternal life. In Matthew 13, 33, he mentioned there's a parable and it mentions that there is a, I'll read the verse to you. 
And he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. And the church in many ways is like that leaven. We grow. As we add more members to the church, we grow and grow and grow. And, and, and the kingdom of heaven is like that. It expands. We keep growing. And God wants us to keep reaching out, not to stay within our four walls, but to reach out to our neighbors, to our friends, to tell them about Christ. God wants us to do that. God wants us to do that. So how did the church begin? What happened? When did it start? It started on the day of Pentecost. After Christ rose from the dead, 50 days later, there was another feast. The feast of the weeks, the feast of weeks. It was the feast of harvest. The feast of the end of the harvest. And everybody went to Jerusalem. I wanted to show you a picture. I don't know if Carlos has it. Do you have it, Carlos? People from all nations went to Jerusalem, to Judea and Jerusalem, from Rome, from Crete, from Pontus, from, from Arabia, everywhere. And they all spoke different languages. And they were all there for that festival. And during that festival... The apostles were, were sitting in a room, and I don't know, they might have been praying. Scripture doesn't specify that, but all, yeah, I think they were praying, and all of a sudden, a rushing mighty wind comes in, and tongues of fire, like flames of fire, appeared on their heads, and they started speaking in other languages that they had not previously learned. And they were filled with the Spirit. And everybody, everybody that was there in the festival heard them speaking. They started proclaiming Christ. And they were astonished because they said, how can these men be speaking in our language? It was a miracle. It was a miracle that occurred. And the Holy Spirit came for the first time to dwell and stay. Before that in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go. We saw that in the life of, of, of uh, King Saul. He was filled with the Spirit when he was anointed, and then he sinned, and the Spirit, poof, gone. In Psalm 51, David prays to the Lord, and that's why he prays, because in the Old Testament, the Lord was, was operating differently. In, in uh, Psalm 51, verse 11, it says, Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. That was then. But now, after, after the day of Pentecost, when we hear the word, we receive Christ as our Savior, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit is not leaving. It stays. It's here to stay. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, it says, in him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, with the promised Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? When you hear the word of, God, of, of the gospel, the truth, and you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit, the, the instant you believe, the instant you put your faith in Christ, he comes to live inside of you. And it says here that you are sealed. Now, who places that seal on your heart? God himself, right? So who could remove it? Nobody is mightier than the Lord. The Lord would be the, one, the only one who could remove that seal. But he's not going to remove the seal because of the following verse. It says that the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance... He is the deposit. He's the guarantee. He's your receipt. The Holy Spirit gives testimony to our spirit, give, gives witness to our spirit that we are saved. That's why I can say, I'm absolutely sure I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. What? How can you say that? That sounds proud. 
No, no, no. I know I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm good. None of us are good. We're all sinners. We're, we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. Heaven is perfect, but we're not. And no matter how hard we try, we cannot earn our way to heaven. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross and he paid for all my sins. And I know, beyond, beyond the shadow of a doubt, I am absolutely sure that I have eternal life. And that who's telling me that? The spirit that lives inside my heart. He's the one telling me, hey, you are saved. You are saved. You are a believer. Who is the, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? So the Holy Spirit will be with us until we are actually face to face in the presence of Christ, enjoying our eternity. And let, me, let me make this point clear. When we accept, eternal life doesn't start after we die, no. Eternal life starts the moment you believe. The moment you believe, you have everlasting life. And then when you pass away, you move on into another stage, which is being perfect, receiving that perfect body where you're, where you're going to be full of joy forever and ever, no more suffering, no more pain, no more sickness. You're going to be with the Lord forever. So the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. So we are sealed and the Holy Spirit does not leave us. Now in verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 it says this. And this is how it ties all together. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So the spirit came to live in me, sealed me. The Lord came to live in my wife when she accepted Christ and sealed her and sealed Danny and sealed Gio and Priscilla and Maddie. And then you know what? All of us, all of us, I don't have time to mention all your names, so excuse me. So the spirit is in all of us and the spirit is one and ties us all together. And there we have the body of Christ, there we have the church. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual, it's, a, it's an organism. It's, it's, it's alive. When Christ left, he ascended and he's sitting at the right of the hand of the Father. He's not physically here, but he is physically here through us, through the church. He does do miracles through the church. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his eyes. That's what the church is the body of Christ here on earth because his physical body is no longer here. He's ascended. He's living at the right hand of the Father, but now he's working through us. And that is an awesome privilege, an awesome blessing. Now, if we backtrack to verse 12 of, of 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for just as the body is one and has many members... And all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. Just as Christ has one body, now we are linked together to form the body of Christ. To work here and to do God's will and to fulfill the great commission on earth. And he does it through us. He's actually doing the work. We're not alone. He's with us doing the work. I think that that is incredibly awesome. Now, the, the reason that we're together and the reason we're, we, we are a church is obviously, I just mentioned it, we have a purpose. We're not here just to meet, and it's awesome that we have friends, but we also have a purpose. We have a purpose we have a purpose. Two things that God wants us to do. One is to care for one another as the church. And two is to reach the lost and make disciples. Reach out and make disciples. Care for one another and reach out and make disciples. And that's what God wants. And God gave us the authority to do this. Jesus gave us the authority. I think this is super cool. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, take a look at these verses. <clears throat> Far above, now Jesus rose from the dead, right? 
far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And look at verse 22. And he put all things under his feet. He put all things in submission under his feet and gave him as head over all things to who? To his angels. No. To the rocks. He said the rocks will cry out if we don't. No. He gave him as head over all things to the church. So we have authority. When we go out and preach, we have the green light. We're doing it under the authority of Christ himself. He's saying, go and do it. We, have the, we can go out with boldness and say, with confidence because we're not doing it on our own. It's not because, hey, you know, I just felt like I wanted to do it. No, it's because God commissioned me to do it. And he gave me the authority as part of the church to go out and preach. I have authority. It says he gave him his all head over all things to the church, number 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we are, we have authority from Christ. We are his body. And it says something even beyond that. We are the fullness of him. He shines through us. Now that leads to a question. How much is Christ actually shining through each of us? God wants to shine through us. He wants us to be a lighthouse to, to others. Not only us individually, but our families, you know, our marriages, our families, all of us. He wants us to shine. We are the fullness of him, the fullness of him. Jesus commissioned us. What did he tell us to do? What did he tell the church to do? What does God want us to do? Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Go and proclaim the gospel. Mark 16, 15. We know Matthew 28, verse 18, 19, and 20. Jesus came and said to them, by the way, this was Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. He was, he was already resurrected. He was, he was standing there in Jerusalem, and he spoke to the apostles, and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and earth. I have the authority. Therefore, since I have the authority, I'm telling you guys, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. What? Make disciples of them. Teach them how to read the word, how to pray, how to have a relationship with God, how to, how to beat areas of weakness in your lives, how to, how to uh, give the gospel, all the things that God has taught us, let's, teach, let's turn around and teach others. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Number one, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God wants us to baptize and, of course, to be baptized. Teaching them to observe, to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you. As you go out, I am with you. You're not alone. You're not doing this alone. No tengas miedo. Don't freak out. Christ is with you. Christ is with us. Christ is with me. God, God has given us the authority to go out and preach the gospel. And I'll tell you the blessing that it's been. Evangelism. A, a couple of weeks ago, I, you know, a bunch, you know, I go every Monday, tomorrow, we will be there, uh, in, by the Dollar Tree here on Bird Road and, and, and 113th, 14th Avenue, where the Home Depot is, 
We're there 5.30 in the afternoon. A couple of weeks ago, I went. Uh, I had a lot of cancellations, and, and I didn't even know if anybody would be there. I had a sore throat, and I said, you know what, but I'm going to go anyway. And I went, and a brother met up with me, and we evangelized, and it was awesome. We shared the gospel with 18 people, and eight prayed and received Christ. And I thought, what a blessing. And I've learned this. This is something that you can write down in your notes. The bigger the sacrifice, the bigger the blessing. You know, I, I, felt, I didn't feel well. I didn't feel well. People had canceled. I could have said, listen, let's just stay home. We'll, we'll go next week. But I didn't. The bigger the sacrifice, if you're not feeling well one day and you come to the meeting, you say, I'm going to do it anyway. Because even though I don't feel well emotionally or physically or whatever, of course, if you're very sick, stay home. We don't want to <laughs> contaminate anybody. But the more we sacrifice, the more we deny ourselves and say, Lord, I'm going to serve you, the bigger blessings we get. The same thing happened the last Saturday we prayed. Remember, Fernando, we, we got together and we started talking and Ralph started sharing about that verse that said, deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And, and then we thought, man, when we deny ourselves, that's when we truly find life. When we deny ourselves, that's when we find life. And I thought, man, when we, this has been such an awesome time. We prayed and we felt the presence of God there. There was a group of us. And you know what? Sacrificing and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to get up a little earlier. You know, I know I'm in my jammies having hot coffee at home and just kind of chilling out. And it, 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 un poco pesado, you know, get dressed and go to church and pray. But you know, when you do it, you get blessed. You get blessed. You get blessed. And I know Mitika is probably with the sisters. We kind of, we split up. And this coming Saturday, we're going to do it. I encourage you guys, come, come. I want to encourage you. The sisters pray downstairs. You don't have to even go upstairs. The men go upstairs. We do the hard work of climbing the stairs. A lot of hard work. Last year, we took a group to the border. I can't tell you what a blessing it was. We left the comforts of home. I mean, we were sweating and it was hard. Those of us who went, right? But the blessing of being able to share the gospel, of see people saved, to be able to help people that were so needy, that, that was, it, it made it more than worth it. Salud and sonrisas, we went this year, and it was incredibly awesome to see so many people saved, to be able to share the gospel for, to, to over a thousand people. It was awesome. It was awesome. When we sacrifice, the bigger the sacrifice, the bigger the blessing. Now, when does, God, when does God want us to preach the word? How often? I love 2 Timothy 4.2. Does anybody know what it says? 2 Timothy 4.2. There you go. Everybody knows what it says. It's on the screen. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season rebuke or reprove, rebuke and exhort and com with complete patience and teaching. So God wants us to preach the word. He told Timothy and he's telling us as well, in season and out of season, when we feel like it, when we don't. God wants us to, to do what, what, what we are called to do, whether we feel like it or not. Have the conviction to say, hey man, this person really needs the Lord and I and." I am, who am I to keep it to myself? Such a precious message. What's going to happen to this person in eternity? I need, to, I need to open my mouth and let God fill it. And you know, it happens that way many times. I open my mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to say. I, I do know what I'm going to say today. I have the notes. But when I share the gospel, sometimes I open my mouth and I'm not sure how I'm going to say it. But you know what? The Lord fills it. The Lord fills it. And I find myself saying things that I thought, Man, did I say that? That was pretty good. No, that was the Lord. It wasn't me. So the purpose of the church is, number one, 
to care for one another. Number two, to reach the lost and make disciples. Help encourage each other. Build each other up. Rebuke each other if we need to. To grow and also reach out. Reach out to the world. Reach out. Reach out. Care for one another. In Galatians 6.2 it says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2. Romans 12.10. Love one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. The local expression of the church. It's like a hospital. We come wounded from walking in the world and we receive help here. It's like an ark. We're here. The world is out there bombarding us and, and it's like a sanctuary. We're here. And of course, there's, this church is not perfect. I don't know of any church that is perfect. We're made out of imperfect humans. But you know what? My conviction is to stick with it. Not to run, not to cut and run when, when I'm having problems, but to work it out. And I'll, I'll tell you, I appreciate my church so much. Wednesday, we, we celebrated uh, Freddie's birthday after the meeting. It was a surprise thing. I didn't know it was planned, but, but a group of us went over there. And, and being there with all these brothers I've known for so many years, over 30 years, I came to Christ in 1974. I went to Rancho Latino and in and, 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 and La Calle 6. And I've known Freddie for f going on 50 years. So many memories with Aldo sitting with him and, and, and talking about, brother, how, how you know, I, I want, you know, I see you have such a strong prayer life. Help me. How, how do you do it? And, and, and how did you do it, you know, thir 13 years as a missionary? And, you know, and we've gone through so many things. We've been in the trenches together, fighting together, encouraging one another, growing together. This is very special. It's very special. And I think that when we hop from church to church to church, we miss out on that. We miss out on that. God wants us to, to have roots in our own church and grow there for years and years and years and to build relationships and to go and plant churches and, do, and go on missionary trips. And, and Yes, but stay connected to your local church because that is where the blessing is. That's where God's going to use us. That's where we fit in. That's where we fit in. Now, I have, I have three questions. As we go through these series, let's do some soul searching and think about these questions and contemplate them as we go through each message in this series on why church. Number one, where do I fit in to my local church? Where do I fit in? Number two, what are my gifts and talents and passions? Where do I love to serve? You know, what, what, would I, what, what do I love? Am I a people person? Am I a servant? Do I like to fix things? You know, what, what, what are the things I love to do? That's where God would use you. Number three, what ministry would I like to serve in? What ministry would I like to serve in? Now, I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. As I conclude, it's obvious that in order for a church to function as God would want it, it's vital that we all have a relationship with Christ. If we're not connected with Christ, then we don't know what to do. If my arm, if the nerves going from my arm to my head are severed, my arm is, doesn't work. It, it won't do anything. My brain will give it messages, but it won't receive the messages. We need to stay connected with the Lord. It's vital that we have a daily relationship with God so that we can know what our marching orders are and what God wants us to do. 
Otherwise, we won't. We'll be doing something else. And, and this weekend, or a couple of days ago, I was, I was listening to an old song, and it's called My Prayer. Excuse me. My Prayer. My Prayer. And consider making this your prayer. The lyrics go like this. Jesus, let me see the things that you have for me. Let me hear your voice whenever you speak to me. Jesus, let me feel your love so great for me. Let me know your way is always the best for me. And you know what? God's way is always the best for us. And God's way during this period of time, during the last days since Christ rose from the dead, is through the church. God's way is through the church. God works through the church. That is God's way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for this time together. Thank you for the study in your word. Thank you that you always enlighten us. You are so awesome. And we want to thank you and praise you. Thank you for dying on the cross, for, for paying for all our sins. Thank you for making us your children and for plugging us into your church so that we can serve. What an awesome privilege being part of your body and letting you shine through us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you help each one of us to stay connected with you and, and to be to give us a willing heart, Lord, to, to serve and to do what you want us to do. Bless the rest of our day. Bless our families. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen.